Thanks for coming today. My name is Jessica Crotty. I'm the Assistant Director of Communications here at the college, and I'm the Chair of the Bicentennial Committee. And today's event is our concluding event uh, for the Bicentennial Celebration. If you did not know, today is Illinois' birthday. It's 200 years old today, so it's kind of a big deal, right? Um, so today what we're doing is we're, we have Kevin Navratil and Mary Pafleis, who are both political science uh, faculty members here. And what they're going to do is talk a little bit about the preamble of the Illinois Constitution, uh, today's Democracy Hour uh, um, topic is the preamble of the Illinois Constitution. So we're going to take a look at it and talk a little bit about if it still holds true today. So it was written 200 years ago. Uh, is it still upheld uh, in today's society? So that's what they're going to address. Um, this, this Democracy Hour is about 20 minutes of presentation, and then really it's meant to be a dialogue. So um, we're looking for all of you to participate in discussion. Uh, the second half of the event, share your thoughts, ask questions. Um, this uh, really is an interactive uh, event. So when we're finished here, we invite all of you over to the lounge where the balloons are. We have cake for, I mean, what's a birthday without cake, right? So. Uh, we have uh, cake and punch over there, so everyone's welcome to come over and have some cake. Tell your friends, text everybody to come over because we have a gigantic cake. So, <laughs> what? I wish no. We are not blowing out 200 candles. So, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kevin and Mary. And uh, again, if you guys have questions, bring them up as we're going through. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Jessica, and, and thanks uh, for everyone to come today. I uh, look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. Uh, thanks to the library for hosting this event today as well. Um, as uh, Jessica pointed out, uh, we want this to, to be uh, dialogue, so you know, feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, Mary and I were planning on just talking for a little bit and then opening it up to you. And right now up on the screen, we have the preamble of the Illinois Constitution. And part of the description of this event was to evaluate how well we are upholding some of these, quite frankly, pretty um, idealistic uh, goals and uh, values in this preamble. So I thought um, I would just show a, 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 a ranking of 50 states of, of kind of where Illinois stands. So there's a lot of suspense right now. <laughs> how, how do you think Illinois is doing? <laughs> Any guesses as to where our state stands in some of these 50 state rankings? <laughs> low. low. We have low expectations. So this is a U.S. News uh, report that's going to compare states on a whole bo bunch of different <laughs> All we did was go from a PowerPoint to a, um, <laughs> to a website. So yeah, technical difficulties happen. Um, but to cut to the suspense, we, uh, Illinois, are ranked 35th overall in these rankings. And um, one of the categories that's bringing us down the most is fiscal stability. Mm -hmm. um, this one in particular, we rank 50th in. And, you know, if you're following the news, it's probably not a surprise to you in terms of the state's credit rating, um, outstanding debt. Um, and of course, most recently, we've had, uh, we went a couple years without having a budget for our state. So fiscally, uh, we're not doing very well. And then I, the other area that I wanted to focus on was, was quality of life, but I guess the way that I would frame it is like, how well are we developing the potential of our, of our citizens of our state? 
And with that, I thought I'd look at, um, you know, kind of get a, a start with education rankings and then kind of provide some suggestions of maybe how we could have improvement because uh, I don't want to just leave on a negative note here and, and um, show how bad we're doing, but I think we have, we're poised for improvement. Um, of course, when you rank 50th, um, there's uh, not a whole <laughs> lot of ways to go, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, so just briefly, since it doesn't look like some of these visuals are going to show up, um, Illinois is lagging in education. Our, our graduation rates are about 20th out of 50 states, um, but our ACT scores are below this, the um, uh, U.S. averages. Um, and, and in particular, I think it's just um, and, uh, we have a lot of underperforming students, students who aren't able to finish high school, students who leave high school and are underprepared. And one of the things I thought I'd tie in with that is um, funding. Uh, one of our big problems of our state is funding, and we have budget issues, and we have these credit ratings. Our ability to borrow um, is very challenged. Um, and I thought the good news is, is our Constitution is actually somewhat new in the sense that it, the most recent version was passed in uh, 1970. And we, as Illinois citizens, have the opportunity of changing our constitution every 20 years. Uh, most recently, we were asked to have a new constitutional convention in um, 2008. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have that opportunity again by 2028. Uh, so thank you, Troy. Uh, these were those rankings that we were desperately waiting for to see <laughs> that our state is basically average at best and below average in some of the key categories. So those were the U.S. Uh, news rankings that I was referring to earlier. Um, so what can we do about it? Well, we, we can change, in particular, our funding. So if you bear with me for just a minute. Um, Now, this is our Constitution. One of the things that I wanted to look at was our, our funding for our state. Um, currently, we have a flat tax. I'm sure you're familiar with this. If you look at your paycheck, 4.95% of your paycheck goes to the state of Illinois income taxes. And we're one of only eight states that have a flat income tax. I wanted to show just a handful of states um, to where they have uh, different tax systems, but I showed a couple of our border states as well. Michigan is one of those other eight states that also has a flat income tax. So with Illinois, that 4.95% income tax, and then off to the right-hand column of this chart, it's showing it, all income is, a, is taxed e equally. So if you're making minimum wage, if you're making $500 million a year, uh, that all that income is taxed identically at 4.95%. So it's an equal flat tax. And again, only eight other states, including Michigan, have a system like that. 31 states have a progressive tax system that is similar in some ways to the uh, federal income tax, but basically it treats income differently. It taxes lower income individuals at a lower rate and higher in income individuals at a higher rate. So I included some of our border states like Wisconsin and Iowa, uh, regional states, um, Minnesota, uh, Missouri, and then just a couple of outliers as well to show um, there, there's so many different ways you could potentially change the income tax structure in the state of Illinois and how that could really alleviate um, a lot of our funding issues particularly our funding I issues for education. So uh, I don't want to get too complicated here, but uh, we can change our tax system in Illinois. It would require a constitutional amendment. We just recently had um, an election where we have a new governor, and it is quite possible that um, the Democrats will propose a change to our tax structure to this progressive tax system. Um, Governor Pritzker elect it didn't mention an exact number, so we're kind of speculating here. But the possibility is that you could tax higher income individuals at a higher rate, and depending upon 
um, how they do it, you could potentially also lower taxes for people um, at lower incomes. So one example um, from an organization called the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, they selected uh, Minnesota as kind of a example to follow. Minnesota's got a really strong economy. Uh, they're leading the country in job growth. And they, this uh, organization, the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability, projected that Illinois could raise an additional $2 billion a year if they changed to the Minnesota system of taxing the highest income individuals um, at around 9%. And that tax structure would only kick in for those we could change it for Illinois uh, instead of having it kick in for individuals who's making more than 160,000. We could have it for individuals who's making more than 300,000. And then they show that we could actually lower taxes for the bottom 98% of all income earners. Uh, it's really left to our imagination. There's so many different ways that you could change this tax structure. It doesn't have to be the one that I just listed from this organization. Um, you could have different brackets for different incomes like we do for the at the federal level. But that's one huge opportunity that we would have to create additional revenue, making the state more competitive. In part, competitive for education because I think one of the key issues that we have in Illinois is our funding for education. There's a lot of different things I could show, um, but one I wanted to point to is that our state is disproportionately reliant on state and local tax dollars for our funding of, of education. Now, right now, what I have up on the screen is K through 12 funding. And our state, I don't know how well you can see this, but it's about 68% of all the revenue um, for K through 12 is essentially coming from your local property tax dollars. The state uh, of Illinois is paying for around 20, 25%, and that is essentially the lowest percentage in the entire United States. So because of that, we're relying so much more on the local property taxes. Um, and the problem with that is that, as you probably know, um, our districts are very unequal. We have over 800 different school districts in Illinois. In some of our best funded school districts, like we have up in the North Shore and places like Winnetka, have about three times the funding per pupil as some of our least funded districts. So that creates in a whole host of inequalities. And earlier, I was kind of starting this off by showing that I think that, you know, tapping into potential of our citizens in this state is one of those areas of opportunity. So that could be something that uh, we could change with uh, a constitutional amendment. It would require 60% support in both the Illinois House and Senate. And then in 2020, we as voters would also have to agree to this change because it's a constitutional amendment. Um, we, because of some of our funding issues in Illinois, and again, I don't know how well this um, chart is coming up, but it's from that same organization that I was referring to earlier, the Center for Tax and Budget Accountability. In the last uh, 20 years, we've had significant changes primarily to higher education funding, which is a 51% change in this 18 year time period. And um, K through 12 funding has essentially been flat. So again, I think there's a, a, a strong justification for changing our tax structure primarily to help fund education. And I think the last part that I would end with uh, is looking at um, back to our tax system of just how regressive it is. There's a lot of ways that you can evaluate how fair your tax system is, but because Illinois disproportionately relies on s uh, the flat income tax, in addition to that, the sales tax, um, low-income individuals really bear a disproportionate burden of the uh, financing of our state's budget. So this organization has kind of taken a regional look again. Um, I don't know how well you can see this in the room. Um, and for the recording of this, I'll just mention um, uh, where Illinois stands out in a few of these areas. So for the lowest um, income earners, those in the bottom. Yep. Oh, thank you. Mary, um, 
we the bottom 20 percent if you take uh, five different income groups the bottom 25 percent of all income earners are paying about 13.2 percent of their uh, income and in, in, uh, towards taxes so it isn't just income uh, they're looking also at uh, excise taxes and sales taxes, property taxes, it's all put together here. So I, I misspoke when I'm just saying income taxes. And then you look to the other end of the spectrum with the top 1% of earners, Illinois um, ranks last with our regional, um, s the states in our region, and that um, the top 1% is really paying a much smaller percentage of their total income towards taxes. And um, most people would describe this as a regressive system where, um, again, we're treating the lowest income earners um, uh, unfairly. Um, and so I, th I just really do think that that's one potential change that we could make to this Illinois Constitution. Um, state constitutions are very different than uh, our federal constitution. They're typically much longer. As you saw earlier with the preamble, they're, they're also much more idealistic, um, but they're they're easier in, in many ways to change, not only with the constitutional convention that you have the potential to vote for for every 20 years, but also just specific constitutional changes that we as voters can make. So I'm gonna leave it there for now, uh, turn it over to my colleague Mary, and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Anyone have any questions now? Feel free, we're pretty casual. Jump in anytime. Um, so I teach, um, in addition to political science, I also teach uh, history, and I've been teaching Illinois local history for some years now. And I posed the question uh, using the preamble of the Illinois State Constitution to my online students and said, you know, based on, on just, and I didn't ask them to be experts on the topic, I just said, you know, looking at this, how do you think the Illinois ranks based on you as students and your experiences, et cetera? And so there was a lot of negative, unfortunate feedback from a lot of things, but I tr I tr I'm trying to focus here on some positive and some negative things here, too. Um, so uh, here's the preamble, and I, I took a couple of the phrases, the idea of eliminating poverty and inequality, and as Kevin mentioned, those are obviously, oh no, did I do it again? Please tell me I didn't do it again. Oh good, okay. That we need to, we, we need to destroy it again. Um, this is obviously a pretty lofty goal, right? The idea of eliminating po po poverty and inequality. Um, and unfortunately in Illinois, I mean, the idea of, of a third of our, our citizens are considered to be either low income, or below the poverty line, or just poor in general. Um, it's not going to surprise you too much that the idea that the people who are disproportionately affected by this tend to be women, and tend to be women, um, uh, women of color, and children, unfortunately. Um, so if you look at these stats here, breaking it down, you've got about 17% are low income, 13% in poverty, and then 6% in what's called extreme poverty. Um, the, the stat that I think I found the most um, interesting, I think as a person who grew up in the suburbs, I grew up right here in Palos Hills, is just the way that the suburbs, the, the nature of, of things have changed. If you watched, you know, movies about Illinois or that featured that were set in Illinois back in the 80s, so movies like, um, you know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off or The Blues Brothers and like good, some good, awesome movies, right? Chicago and the, and the state kind of looked a little bit seedy. It always did, right? It, it, there's kind of always a look to it where it looked like it was kind of dirty. Most cities at the time, though, were kind of, uh, kind of on the, uh, declining uh, in the post-war era. Um, but what you're seeing now is sort of this shift where I remember seeing the movie... Um, in 1997, My Best Friend's Wedding with Julia Roberts. You guys remember that movie? And all of a sudden, the city looked fantastic. And so there's this, been this interesting shift. Well, what's happened? Have we just simply eliminated poverty and suddenly the city looks fantastic? And the, the answer is unfortunately no. We've just transplanted the people that were of in, in poverty in the city before and moved them out to outlying areas in the suburbs. Um, and so that, that problem has not gone away. As a matter of fact, the poverty rate has gone from 34% to roughly right now in 2018, about 50% which is it's a pretty alarming stat, right? Um, so this idea of eliminating poverty and inequality, it, I mean, is that even a possibility ever? Um, maybe making it better could, uh, could be one possibility. And so maybe as, as Kevin alluded to, the idea of changing us from a, a flat tax or more to a more of a proportionate tax might be one particular answer for that. Um, the other one I wanted to talk about is the idea of, of legal, social, and economic justice, right? Again, these are very kind of vague terms, but what does that mean? So. Uh, a couple things, well, a couple positive things and a couple negative things. If you looked at, I don't know if any of you saw the 60 Minutes piece that I think was about a year ago or two years ago where um, Sheriff Tom Dart from Cook County was on, was being interviewed on 60 Minutes and he talked about how 50% of the, of the people, the inmates of Cook County Prison right then and there, he said should not be in prison. Most of them have, are, are mentally ill or they can't afford bond and they're in prison because of those, those two reasons. 
And oftentimes, people who are mentally ill are actually trying to get back into prison because that's the only place where they're actually getting some care. Uh, because of the decline of our infrastructure and the closing of a lot of mental health facilities, such as Tinley Park over on um, uh, Harlem and 183rd, 100 and yeah, 183rd. Um, so that, that is, is, is one particular issue. Now, the good news on that, that since D Tom Dart was on 60 Minutes, that's actually gotten better. Right now, in 2018, uh, we are at the lowest, that Cook County's got the lowest amount of inmates that it's had in years. Um, that, so that, that is going on, I think, about 5,900 inmates currently, which is actually a pretty decent number compared to where it was before. One of the reasons why they think that is the case is because something has changed in a, in a, in a very good way um, that Illinois was pretty bad about. So the idea was that if you could not post bond for yourself, you were essentially stuck in prison, languishing in prison until you could afford to get out. Um, and if you, it could be a very small crime, right? Something that's maybe not necessarily, but you had people who were maybe in jail for maybe a marijuana charge for a year because they could not afford to post, post bail. Or you might borrow from one of those um, um, bond loan companies that are charging you outrageous interest rates. And so you get out, but then you owe like 100% interest on, your <laughs> on what you just borrowed. Um, so this is the cycle of poverty. Or if you're in jail and you can't get out, you lose your job so that you're in prison, that you lose a job that you had, you can't afford to take care of your kids, the car that maybe you had is repossessed, and it's all this kind of cycle that follows. So they're trying to actually, um, Illinois has made some changes, again, in a positive way, um, that bond court has changed. And they're training their judges um, to actually kind of ch uh, change the way that they've been handling situations. I read uh, multiple accounts of, of people talking about they'd go before a judge, you'd have like 30 seconds or a minute in front of a judge. Um, they w there was no time to talk about nuance, about what was going on in your life. You had, you had maybe a, um, a, a court defender, a uh, public defender, who you know, maybe had 10 minutes to work on your case before, they were, you, know, before you went before court. Um, and oftentimes you were given kind of an outrageous sum for bond. Well, now they're, they're requiring judges after training to actually take more time on this issue. Um, and that you can't, in some cases, they're limiting it. You can't go above a certain amount based on the person's income. And that's actually also kind of depleted uh, our, our prison ranks, which is a good thing because they're, they're pretty darn overcrowded. So these are kind of some good things. And the last thing I wanted to point out in terms of actually one good thing, I figure we, we have got to get some positive things going on, right, um, is the fact that we are one of the few states that does um, restore voting rights to felons who have served their time. Florida just recently in this last election voted to change that as well. Um, potentially opening up about what 1.5 million uh, voters to the ranks for 2020, which is going to be interesting in the next presidential election. But we are one of the states that that um, does allow uh, former felons to to vote. But part of the problem is, though, to unfortunately, is that oftentimes they don't even know that. Um, they're often misinformed, don't get that information, and so that is also a problem. Okay, um, something positive again that I wanted to focus on. Um, this is kind of a good thing, right? Going along again with the idea of health, safety, and welfare. Uh, Rahm Emanuel wrote um, an op-ed, I think it was, in, I it was in the Trib recently, or where I read it, uh, about how even though the United States has pulled out of the, the Paris Climate Accord, um, that he's saying that Chicago will be a signatory of that, of the that we, were, we are going to fulfill our mission um, to, to the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so I want to pull up, I just Googled here briefly. I was staying in a hotel last year, and I just noticed um, the building next to us, because we were pretty high up, and how it had a garden rooftop, and it was just awesome to see that, and how Chicago actually has, oh, no, it did it again, didn't it? Darn it. No. Come back. I don't know. Sorry. Technical difficulties. Anyone have questions or comments Well. uh we're getting that back up on the prison thing or an experience anybody that has with, with relatives who've gone through the, pr the prison system or friends. I actually um, I want to send a shout out to one of my students, actually. I can't, I, I'm not going to obviously say who it was, but um, the student was very forthcoming in talking about her own experience within the um, Illinois prison system and talking about how the fact that um, she was able to afford an attorney, what a difference it made for her. And it was, she was actually even al allowed to go to school under her, um, because of the fact that she had a decent attorney. That probably would not have been possible had she not, had she not been able to afford an, attor an attorney. Um, so just Googling the idea of, of Chicago Green Initiatives, got all these wonderful, lovely pictures, right? The idea of all these rooftops, they're even on top of McDonald's. I don't think it's the, I think it's the one that's on, um, the one that's in uh, the Gold Coast area. Um, that, is it like, is that one closed though? I think 
someone just closed actually recently. I'm not sure, but they, they had a rooftop garden. If it's closed on, it's kind of a shame. But um, anyway, what you're seeing is there's multiple uh, uh, places where there are rooftop gardens happening. Um, and we've actually, we've, we have, have um, vowed to lower our greenhouse emissions uh, according to the Paris Climate Agreement and even exceed them by 2020 by 25 percent. So that's, that's one of the good things. Um, also, the idea of how many bike lanes have been put up. Did I do it again? <laughs> how many bike lanes have gone up in, in recent years? Or the ability to rent a bike and go somewhere. I mean, that's something that you'd see oftentimes in Europe, um, but not as much here. And now you're seeing it much more in Chicago, which is a great thing. Um, or more and more people who are actually biking to work even in the wintertime. My, my sister talks about there's always one man on 191st Street. We live in, south of, in Will County, south of 80. Rain, shine, snow, blow, this guy's out there with his bike and rides to work or either to the train it might be every single day. And I thought, God bless him. Like, that's just fantastic. More of us could, I'd love to do that. If I could ride in Moraine all the way down LaGrange Road on paths, I would do it if I could in the warmer months. But it gets a little dicey there when you're going over the CalSeg Channel and their cars careening all over the place. You know, you might be uh, end up getting hit by a car. So that wouldn't be pleasant. So um, the last thing, unfortunately, to end on kind of more of a, a, a sour note, um, again, looking at health, safety, and welfare, I thought I'd pull out some stats on gun violence. And this is a recent article um, from Axios.com about Chicago gun violence. You know, you heard President Trump talk a lot about Chicago and how it's, uh, it's just a complete chaos there. And, um, and of course, some, of the, some of it was a lot of hyperbole, but oh, it went off again, I'm sorry. It, it takes it out, huh? But now you know how to do it, so we're good. Thank you. Sorry about that. This will be the last time I won't be going back to my... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything you want to add, to since you're up here? <laughs> there it goes. It's there. Thank you, sir. Um, so one of the things that... that uh, this is from August, I believe saying that even by the beginning of August, you had 27 people that were killed by gun violence. But there are a variety of different reasons why. Um, I, I get, I've gotten into, let's say, heated discussions with people before about the idea, well, you know, if Chicago has got like, you know, these strict gun control laws, then how come there's so much gun violence there? The, the reasons aren't so simple. Um, if, you, if you took out the idea of the fact that people can easily obtain weapons and bring them in from places like Northwest Indiana, where it's not as highly regulated, that accounts for about 20% of the violence. Um, the idea of also racial segregation. Chicago, and this might be surprising to some of you, when Martin Luther King came to Chicago in the 1960s, he remarked that you know, he's been all over Alabama, all over Georgia, all over Mississippi, and no city has been as segregated as, as Chicago. Um, and how, how he was struck by the idea, uh, he could not believe how much um, racism and violence and segregation there was here. Um, so whenever I, I'm, I kind of have to check myself and my students when we're talking about putting it in the context of history that you know it wasn't like things were so hunky-dory in the city of Chicago while things were so bad down south. We've had plenty of our own violence um, and large amounts of KKK members here um, throughout the 20th century. But this is breaking it down in terms of looking at demographics and homicide in Chicago. So looking at the amount of gun deaths and the, and the darker red it gets is the, the, the higher the number. Income um, is the green. So the lower the number versus the, the lighter is the higher the number. So you're seeing obviously less gun violence taking place where there's higher income areas. And then looking at in terms of race, areas where it's, it's white only. Um, and so obviously you're seeing a more disproportionate amount of violence taking place in areas that are, are more low income minority. Let's see here. So there's a couple of things. I just I thought rather than put on the PowerPoint, I would just put this up here. So they highlighted one particular neighborhood, the Austin neighborhood on the west side that just within the first seven months of, sh of, of 2018, you basically had about 12% of the total, norm total number of shootings that took place took place in that particular neighborhood. Um, so why is that the case? So um, kids are you know, talking about the idea of kids saying that they, they're worried they may not make it home again. But you're looking at income inequality and that the majority of this neighborhood that's, that's particularly African American, um, that basically it, they're $20,000 less than the medium household income in the rest of the city. So obviously there's a correlation between the two. Um, and I, I like this quote from Colleen Daly, who's uh, uh, from the Illinois Council Against Handgun Violence, that nothing stops a bullet like an opportunity. So clearly there's a, there's a, there is an a, a, a opportunity for us as Chicagoans and as Illinoisans to do better than we are doing. The amount of unsolved crimes, uh, the amount of guns illegally owned um, and br bringing in. So even though, again, it's illegal to sell or distribute, a lot of those, like, 
percent of those guns are coming in from Indiana that has like the weakest gun laws in the nation. So anyway, I, it's kind of maybe more of a depressing note to, to stop on. I should have switched them and had the, the green initiatives end with that as opposed to this. But um, that's the areas where we have opportunities, I think, to do a little bit better for our citizens that maybe we're not doing as well on as we could. So anyone have any thoughts or comments on any of these, any of these things? on the idea of gun violence or even the, the green initiatives that you're seeing. It doesn't, even, doesn't even have to be a question, even just a comment. Any positivity? Yes, ma'am. So the question is how likely do we think that there will be a constitutional initiative to change the, the income tax? I think there's 100% chance that the Illinois legislature attempts this and, you know, 90% chance that they're able to achieve it. I think, um, you know, Pritzker's entire agenda is, is predicated on this. Um, it's it's kind of holding everything together that he would like to do. Um, whether he does this first, the marijuana legalization, I think, is also, you know, something that's likely to happen soon. But as far as the... Um, uh, likelihood of it passing now keep in mind it has to come back to us in 2020 um, how many voters show up um, how this is framed I don't even know how they're exactly going to outline this tax structure change one of the things I was trying to do with showing some of those other states is you know you could have really um, high incomes before the highest level of tax kicks in like New York is about $1 million of income. So it really depends upon how they structure it. Um, I think if they're able to show that there's tax relief for so many low-income individuals, um, but it requires a super majority of us to, to support it. So um, right now I'd say it's, I, I, would, I wouldn't bet against it. I think there's at least a 50% chance that this change happens. Um, and I, I'm, I don't rarely put my opinions out there, but uh, this is one I think should happen. You know, I don't, I don't think um, the flat tax structure is working well for us, and uh, I think we need a change. You know, that's a great question. I think that was one of the reasons of that institute that I was referring to picked the Minnesota as an example because I think one of the first critiques that you would have is that, you know, you're going to have a flight of people out of Illinois because of higher taxes. But if you're able to lower taxes on, on most taxpayers, especially low-income individuals, and then I think the other the, the issue here is if you were able to take change the tax structure, you might be significantly less reliant on the property tax um, component of the the um, funding structure. So I again, I don't know how it, the details are going to be ironed out in Springfield, but there is a possibility of, 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 of trying to uh, limit uh, property taxes in conjunction with this as well. Um, but um, you know, other states like California have had huge budget surpluses. They've got great economic times, Minnesota as well. I, I mean, it's 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 hard to find um, evidence for you know. There's been states like K Kansas that have significantly reduced taxes and reduced taxes on corporations, and they have huge budget deficits, and they've they've seen a lot of uh, you know negative economic times. So. You know, I don't think that there's evidence that somehow tax changes are necessarily going to lead to um, fewer jobs or an outgrowth of people. But again, it really depends upon how it's structured. I was going to add not about that necessarily, but just about one of the, one of Pritzker's other promises that um, appealed to me in particular, just as a, as an issue as an Illinoisan, is the issue of mental health. And I think that one one of the couple of things I highlighted in there that if it's possible either through, through if the marijuana initiative were to pass and the idea of having some extra revenue coming in with that, um, if we could either open up some more institutions or, or at least devote some more funding to it, that's a problem that we're facing all over the place. That's a problem that could help alleviate the prison issue, um, even on this campus, right? We're seeing, we're, you're hearing, and not just our campus, um, talking to counselors at, at Elmhurst College too, I, I, where I used to work years ago, they're inundated with students 
who are struggling with with more issues now. And so it seems like that's something that we kind of almost have to do. Um, and that maybe further down the line that will have a, a more positive ripple effect on on overall society with the issue of prison, with the issue of poverty, with the issue of, of um, just kind of mental health for everyone. So uh, that's that's one thing I'd like to see. And in terms of going back to the question about the, um, the, f the migration, you know, one of the bigger issues too is property taxes, why people are leaving. And we're definitely gonna lose, we were talking about at least one seat, if not more, um, in the Electoral College in the next round in 2020 after the 20, 2020 census. But who knows, I, I, I agree with Kevin's assessment, the idea that if the proportionate tax does not, is, is actually helping the majority of people, that could actually maybe even bring some people back. Um, and also, I'm kind of also curious to see down the road, this may be a long time down the road, but one of the articles I was reading is just talking about with climate change, how that actually might be sending some people back, a lot of people who've, who've left to go to, to warmer states actually back into the frost belt because we're having fewer effects on it um, than they are in other states too. So we'll see, I guess it's something else to kind of keep an eye on. In regards to like the, um, the legalization of marijuana specifically in Chicago, are there any drawbacks to that? Just curious. Specific to Chicago? Or yeah, well, I mean, just in general, actually. So, you know, I, th to first, let me just say that I'm not an expert in this area, <laughs> um, but I think you'd want to look at other states. You know, I think one of the issues, if, you know, from from following the literature a little bit, when when states like Colorado, there's been concerns about younger people um, and traffic fatalities, and sometimes also. Um, people coming from border states and traveling through and those border states suing, feeling like, you know, I want to say the state of Nebraska was, um, you know, filing a lawsuit against Colorado because they felt like there's so many people driving through their state to, uh, for the purchase of recreational marijuana. So I think there'd be a lot of, you know, at this point, we're not a leader. You know, there's, there's already 10 states who have um, legalized marijuana. So I think you'd want to do kind of best practices of, of looking at whether it's the amounts, the age limits, and so forth, um, all, all sorts of regulations over who can sell it and, and um, uh, to, to, to make it successful. But, um, you know, there's, there's certainly downsides with any policy, but I think it's inevitable that this happens. Um, especially now that Michigan's legalized uh, marijuana, I think in some ways, if we're talking about revenue, um, and I, you know, I know that there was a non-binding -bi um, referendum in the most recent election where if you could use that revenue for education funding and so forth or treatment facilities, um, I think it's, uh, again, I don't often put my views out there, but I think it's something that um, Illinois should look, look to, to change. Colorado does have it regulated, so I mean, it's not like it's, it, 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 I think part of it is it's almost like the beginning when, you know, prohibition went into effect and then it was legalized again. There were a lot of kinks along the way, right? You, you know, you had drunk driving and then you had more regulation of things with, with groups like Mothers Against Drunk Driving that now we've kind of gotten almost down, I wouldn't say down to a science, but to the point where I think it's we're pretty, pretty much most people are pretty clear as to what they can and cannot do regarding alcohol. Um, Colorado already has got rules in place like you know you can't just be standing around the street corner just smoking a joint like it's you know it's got to be done in or if you buy something like uh, brownies not that I'm an expert at all either I want to also preface by saying that but if you were to buy food with it like uh, brownies or um, some of the other things that you cookies I think you could buy too um, it's got to be done like in in private places you can't just be walking around you know high and hanging out because they have had an issue where they've been they've been arresting people for that so I think it's something that they, they're going to continue to kind of flush it out and then as, as, as Kevin alluded to we'll kind of borrow from what works for them and and change it as we need to for us but it's a good it's a good question and hopefully it's a decent source of revenue right I mean if we're gonna why not make money off of it if it's people are gonna do it anyway then and the state needs money we see we're 50th <laughs> when it comes to the money stuff obviously we've got some work to do so Other questions, comments, reactions? Yeah, Arish. Um, so as far as the education, so with tax reform and structure, do you think um, that that they'll be less reliant on local tax, like local funding for schools, if there's a reform? 
that uh, that's my hope is that the the change to that uh, pie chart that was showing that right now roughly 68 percent of all the funding comes from uh, local sources that that would change and that the state would be able to pick up a bigger slice of that um, now just in the last year we did have a, a tweak to, to the funding system um, and they created around uh, I want to say 350 million dollars for the the lowest funded school districts um, the underperforming schools as well. So we, we we're kind of moving in that direction to, to kind of create more equity. Um, but I, I definitely think that that, that would be a, a strong possibility if they were able to have that change to the, to the, the tax structure. Um, yeah, another question so in the back. So local property taxes are set by local municipalities. Do you think they'll be, they'll force, the state will force them to reduce property taxes or will they just go, it's a windfall for something else? Well, that's a good question. I, it, you know, there is always a possibility that the state could somehow limit property tax increases. I know we had a governor who that was a big uh, pledge, but I think that um, anytime y I, y you're asking your, your local taxpayers to increase, you know, bonds or local tax rates to pay for um, funding, you know, it, it's not always so popular, especially recently. And, and I think, you know, we, we may have gone to the well one too many times with that as well. So I think that, you know, the, the local municipalities would be really um, happy to not have to pick up such a slice, a disproportionate, you know, it's just not the way other states do this, is funding it so much at the local level. So I would think that they would be happy, um, you know, without speaking for them, that they wouldn't have to pick up such a disproportionate burden of the education funding. Oh, well, that, that would be, yeah, you would have to make a change to, to lower the property taxes, but, you know, I, that's, that's a possibility um, that, that they could do that. I mean, well, I mean, so um, in the suburb where I live, the, the, the village board is always showing new budget. We didn't raise your taxes. If they could say, hey, we just cut your taxes by 5%, I think they would like that. That would be a great campaign slogan all across <laughs> Illinois if there would be a trade-off from the state where the state is picking up that difference. So, right. it, But I think the, the question is a good one. What's the mechanics so that in the end we're not paying higher property taxes or the same property taxes with higher income tax together, right? Like exactly. that something's got, there's got to be some leadership there to, to make it happen. Well, <laughs> I was wondering if that would come up, and I, I d there is kind of an, uh, uh, another elephant in the room as far as the f uh, budget issue goes, and, and I think um, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it. So I thought I had, yeah, it's in here. So this is the pension. So, yeah, it was Section 5. I guess I had it up there. Um, somebody had mentioned pensions, and I know we're down to a few, mention, uh, a few minutes, but um, essentially, w uh, I want to say one out of every four uh, tax dollars is going, or one out of four dollars of our state budget is going towards pensions. There's been many efforts to try to reform pensions. They've all been struck down as unconstitutional. So when I was talking about, um, can you, do you have the pointer? Oh. No, thanks. It's section five. So this is the um, article five, or article eight, section five, um, where it's basically showing that um, the, the pensions can't be diminished or impaired. And so, um, one of the biggest, you know, the, one of the biggest reasons that uh, there's a lot of reasons that our our our, pun our, our pensions are underfunded, but um, one of the biggest issues that we have of being 50th as far as fiscal st uh, uh, stability is this issue of how to deal with our long-term pensions, and they're roughly 40% funded, and um, you know, over you know, 100 billion dollars in obligations. So. It, it's going to be difficult getting two billion dollars an extra year of revenue with the one scenario what I was mentioning about uh, raising income taxes doesn't fix this. So at some point there there needs to be 
um, improvement, I'm just going to say, some dealing with this major issue because you can't take, you know, 25% of all of the, the uh, funding issue with the, you know, where one of every $4 is going to pensions and leave that off the table a, as far as something that um, uh, is challenging our, our state's budget. So uh, I, I certainly don't have the solution to it, but, um, you know, it's something that we need to look at. We're so close to avoiding that, too. All right. Final two minutes. Any other questions or comments you guys have? All right. <laughs> Jessica's reminding us there's cake off by the balloons. So thanks for coming. Enjoy some cake and happy birthday, Illinois. Thanks for coming there.